Hello, I'm Colin Baker. Of course I am, whether you like it or not. And you are watching The Sirens of Audio. Keep watching. It's good. On one level, it's more lighthearted. And yet there's a lot of compassion and pain in it. It's, it's more real in a lot of ways. It's not such a fantasy story. I know pirates. That sounds like fantasy, doesn't it? But no, it's, um, it, seem, it does seem much closer to real life. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip. Today is uh, another anniversary theme show. We're going to be doing that for the next couple of months, I reckon. And uh, we're going to be focusing on a single story today uh, because it's uh, the anniversary of this particular story. And in the podcast over the years, we have managed to do my favourite Big Finish story, which is The Chimes of Midnight. This one's yours, Philip, so I'd like you to talk about it. Oh, gee, thanks. Yeah, this is my favourite Big Finish story. It's called The Pirates. And the reason why it's my favourite is episode three, two. Oh, two is a musical. Episode three. Three, episode three is a musical. Um, and so, yeah, all the cast get to sing songs. It's got Bill Oddy in it. It's got Helen Gold in it. Um, it's the sixth Doctor and Evelyn. It's just the perfect combination of people and characters and actors. Um, well directed. It's just a lot of fun. And it still makes me cry. It's one of the few Big Finish episodes that every time I listen to it, I I get a tear because it's, it manages to do the whole gamut of hilarious and then tragic at the same time. Because even though, yeah, yeah, even though it's very comedic in some parts, it's got a very dark tone to it in a couple of different ways, but particularly with Helen Goldwyn and Evelyn, their relationship is a very, very dark story. So um, it's really nicely done. Had, had Doctor Who ever done anything like it before? No, I don't think there's ever been a Doctor Who episode like it on TV, in any media. So I think it was a special reach out of all sorts of things. It deals with a topic that is very rarely, well, that's up to that stage was very rarely dealt with. It's been, I think it's a topic that's been dealt with a bit more since then. Um, but yeah, it's just very powerful. Evelyn is amazing. E but even Evelyn shows signs of weakness and tiredness and just having a companion who is exhausted and yeah, being pushed beyond her limits was a, a very special moment. So it's just, I could go on for hours and we've got lots of guests to go on with us, so <laughs> I shouldn't, but I think it's an amazing story. And if you haven't listened to it, for goodness sake, you know, get this one and listen to it. Is it on Spotify too? I think this yes. is probably, so this is free, it is. On, it's free on Spotify for goodness sake. Um, please yep. listen to it because it is, you know, one of the all time best. I mean, there, there's, there are so many fantastic stories, but to me, this is probably still number one. Yeah. And you mentioned the guests. We've got a, a few of the guests who appeared in the episode lined up. We've got, we're going to play some archive material from our interview with Colin Baker because we did talk to Colin about the pirates when we had him on. So we're going to put that in here. We've got some uh, a new interviews with Helen Goldwyn, uh, Nick, Nick Pegg and Tim Sutton. Uh, so that should be fascinating. These are brand new interviews that we're very excited excited to bring to you. So how would how if if someone wasn't a musical fan, like obviously you're you're the musical fan, so anything that's musical you're you're going to be instantly drawn to. But I think for me as a non well I non musical fan, I like music, but maybe not so much musicals. I'm not drawn to them so much. Um, how would you convince someone else that, that this is worth listening to? Well, the musical element is only a small part. It, it's, 
in, in many ways, this is the story of Scheherazade, who has to every night tell a story. Before, you know, she's going to be put to death the next day. But you know, every day when she can entertain the king with a story, she gets another day to live. And in some ways, each episode is kind of following that model. It's a Scheherazade have to tell a story model. And so the musical episode is only one part of that story. And as much, as much as it's a musical, it's not a typical music in terms of having the I Want song or the comedy song before the tragic song. It doesn't quite follow the same mode. It's using Gilbert and Sullivan uh, tunes. So I don't know if people know Gilbert and Sullivan, but they wrote a very long time ago. Um, Pirates of Penzance would be probably their most famous work, but they've done lots of um, others like the Mikado and uh, many others, HMS Pinafore. And so they've taken the songs, the tunes from there because they're public domain now because they were written so long ago and added new words to it. So it, it really is just using music for humor. So it's it's probably more more than a music, it's probably more like doing a comedy riff, um, a review. It's more probably in that sort of style than, than a flat out musical would be. But that being said, there's enough elements in there that just you know, make me smile every time. And obviously the big guest cast for this one is Bill Oddy as uh, Red Jasper. Do you, perfect casting, do you think? <laughs> um, Bill Oddy, um, most people probably know him from The Goodies. He was the small, hairy one in The Goodies. Very musically talented himself. He wrote all the music for The Goodies, often performed. I mean, they all performed to various styles. He was the one who actually could sing and play instruments. The others um, were always entertaining with their singing, but they weren't actually singers like he was. So yeah, bringing Bill Oddy in was hilarious. I mean, the, the funny story about that is the fact that um, his agent actually rang him up to ask him whether he could sing or not, because there was singing in this in this big Finnish production, and he sort of went, "How do you not know whether I sing or not as my agent?" So, <laughs> so he got he got into trouble there. Now, I mean, Bill Oddy, the 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 pirate king that he plays is uh, comedy, but he's also insane, and Bill Oddy manages to hit those notes of craziness. I think the goodies allowed him to play a whole, whole gamut of characters, and he brings them all to this production. I knew absolutely nothing about it, except when my um, agent rang me up and said, oh, they want to know whether you can sing, which I thought was a bit of an insult coming from my own flipping agent. <laughs> and I've spent half my life writing songs and singing them and so on and so forth. Thought, oh, good, well, they really know about me. I wonder what jo other jobs they've turned down in the past. Oh, I don't think you can sing. Uh, they're young. They're young. They don't remember. <laughs> And some challenging lyrics there for Colin Baker in, uh, in, in that song. What's that song called? That Gil Gilbert Sullivan song? The Gilbert Sullivan song is I am, the very model, I am the very model of a modern major general. Yes. But Colin Baker... They've changed it completely. The, I am the very model of a... Gallifreyan... Gallifreyan buccaneer. Buccaneer. A Gallifreyan right. buccaneer. Yeah. And he manages to include every... I think every monster the Doctor had faced up to that point... Uh, names every planet, names all the Time Lords. Um, it is hilarious. And then some, some of the lyrics and some of the rhymes are just to die for. You, if you've already listened to it, you don't want to go back and listen to it again. If you haven't listened to it that much, you're going to have to go and listen to it now. And you've gone and ripped off your, your own per private collection of the songs, haven't you? I do. I have an iTunes, <laughs> which is just all the songs. I've just got all the songs in, a, in an album for the Pirates, which is on my iTunes, which I regularly play. So it was thrilling, actually, uh, Tim Sutton, who who did all the music for the Pirates. It's going to be uh, fascinating to share that interview with him because he has uh, a lot of interesting things to say on the music side of things. Yeah, it was a very bold production because, you know, usually they have two days to film a two-disc CD, and they gave him an, an extra day because just to do that, all the music and the songs, and, and even though they'd all been practicing beforehand, just to bring, bring them all together and do the recording for the music um, at an extra day. And it was, it, I think you'll hear in the interviews how they did it. It was yeah. A, yeah, a great process. M massive shout out, though, to the writer of the story, Jack Rayner, who's managed to write something with a lot of depth, even though it's set on the sea. We can say it's got a lot of depth to it. Um, I, I think Jack has done lots of great stories over the years, and particularly those early years, because she she had a lot of involvement with Evelyn, didn't she? She wrote... She wrote the Marion Conspiracy yep. and uh, a couple of those, a couple of other ones, particularly with Evelyn. So uh, she was able to get those really emotive uh, storytelling beats. Uh, and oh, there's another musical term. Um, so yeah, big big shout out to Jack Rayner. Yes, indeed. 
Okay. All right. Well, we'll bring Colin Baker's uh, interview on in a moment. But before we do, how about I just read the blurb and then we'll go into a trailer for Doctor Who and the Pirates. Oh, do I have to do it in the pirate accent? All aboard, me hearties, for a rip-roaring tale of adventure on the high seas. Doesn't sound so good with an Australian accent, does it? There'll be rum for all and sea shanties galore as we travel back in time to join the valiant crew of the good ship Sea Eagle, braving perils, pirates, and a peripatetic old sea dog known only as the Doctor. Gasp as our Gallifreyan buccaneer crosses swords with the fearsome Red Jasper, scourge of the seven seas, and possessor of at least one wooden leg. Thrill as evil Evelyn, the pirate queen, sets sail in search of buried treasure with only a foppish ship's captain and an innocent young cabin boy by her side. Marvel at the melodious mayhem which ensues as we sail the ocean blue and wonder why Evelyn still hasn't realised that very few stories have happy endings. You know what always goes well with cake and a cuppa? A good story. And you know what makes a good story? Pirates. We were serving under Ezekiel Bones, the most feared man ever to sail these seas. It was near the Ruby Islands. This is awful. Pirates. We've already established that. I say, what's going on? My hammock's all wet. <laughs> Don't you worry, Captain Swanson. No pirate will take the brave sea eagle. Ah, you think so, do you? You're no pirate. I take that as a compliment. <coughs> You're not going to see. Cowards. You rotters. Better to die a loyal subject than succumb to the lawlessness of piracy. We can feel it in me bones. The treasure is still there! Treasure? Well, me name, you see. Me name's really James, see. Only, they took to calling me Jem. Said he was glad he hadn't brought all the other gems home, cos one was enough for him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr Smythe, but this is just ridiculous. Oh, all right. Let's say he only had one wooden leg. And what's more, I will have it! Oh, no! You are going to sing. Well, yes, I am. One of my favourite stories you did was called The Pirates, which was the musical episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was it like to get to, to strut your uh, musical theatre background? Uh, well, Gilbert and Sullivan plays a large part in my life because without Gilbert and Sullivan, I wouldn't have been an actor, probably because the school I went to at the age of 11, uh, an all-boys school, did a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta every year, uh, all male. And at the age of 12, I was cast as Phyllis in Ialanthe. Um, uh, and I got a review in my school magazine saying, Colin Baker, threw himself with great verve into the part of Phyllis and rarely strayed more than half an octave from the note. <laughs> so I gleaned late at the time. I thought that was a good review. Yeah, I really strayed what an octave was. Didn't know what a note was. Um, but I knew I loved acting at that point. And the following year, I was Rose Maybud in Ruddy Gore. Um, and the acting was all right again, I think. Can't guarantee the singing. Um, and I just found it was being somebody else was easier than being me at that point. Because um, I, like a lot of actors I've discovered, they didn't have much confidence when they were younger. So if they could pretend to be something else that they weren't, I mean, I, I, I became that funny boy in the class the one that takes the mick out of the teacher and gets into trouble. But I did it because then I wasn't in trouble with my peers. I did actually once set fire to the interior of my desk. So smoke poured from the hole where the inkwell used to be. And I pretended not to notice it and was told by the poor teacher who was, bless him, he, he wasn't very strong. Um, oh, Baker, your desk is on fire. Oh, is it? 
and uh, to gales of laughter from the rest of the class. I suffered for it. I got punished, of course, but but the my my fellow pupils liked me more than they had before. <laughs> so uh, I, I think a lot of actors have stories similar to that that entertain your enemies and you won't be crushed. So yeah, Gilbert and Sullivan, um, and you're talking about the pirates. Yep. Yeah, I was. I, I think um, that was written by. Was Pirates written Jack, by Jack Rayner? Rayner. Jack and Rayner. It was Jack Rayner, yeah. Um, uh, Jack Rayner, who's now producing my stories for Big Finish. Um, and she knew that I had a, 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 a crush on Gilbert and Sullivan. So she wrote me a very cleverly reworded, I am the model of a modern major general. Um, and I remember with great trepidation, I'm all right with the acting, but you know, I, as I mentioned, singing isn't always my forte. But patter songs from GNS are somewhat different to the, the um, principal soprano, which I played at school. And uh, I am the very model of a Gallifrey and Buccaneer. That's all I can remember. <laughs> um, but we got through it, a couple of takes. So uh, I, I haven't listened to it for a long while. I must do that. But I love the story. It was so Arabian Nights-ish, um, you know, the, the idea of entertaining someone so they don't kill themselves. Yeah. Um, and having heard my voice, I'm surprised she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very powerful ending again, too. And then years later, of course, um, after doing it at school, I, I, I played Sir Joseph Porter KCB in a national tour for the um, an opera company of uh, H.H. Pinafore and got away with it. So uh, I was quite proud of that. I am the very model of a Gallifreyan buccaneer. I've information on all things a Gallifreyan holds must I've linked it to the matrix through its excitonic circuitry. I understand dimensional and relative chronometry. I'm very well acquainted too with matters of the capital. I'll give you a verse and chapter on Panopticonian protocol. I've been into the death zone and I played the game of Rassilon. Rassilon? Rassilon? Basilon? Aha! With pestilential monsters that I got a lot of hassle from. With pestilential monsters that he got a lot of hassle from. With pestilential monsters that he got a lot of hassle from. With pestilential monsters that he got a lot of hassle hassle from. Even though that's uh, that's archive footage of Colin, it's always good to hear from him, and it seemed like that was production that he really enjoyed get it sinking his teeth into. Well, it's one of those ones that stands out. I mean, how many dozens and dozens of stories has he done for Big Finish now? I mean, yeah. years and years more than the TV show that he was in. And the fact that he, yeah, it's, it would be hard to remember that they go in for a couple of days, walk out. We don't expect them to remember m- many of the shows. The fact that he could remember this one shows how much it stood out to him and to stood out to the cast at the time. Yeah. So someone else who was involved in this as an actor was Helen Goldwyn, and we we know Helen mainly these days at Big Finish for her directing and writing and writing yeah. uh, abilities. So we see her more on the credits in those roles. But back then, she was doing a lot of acting with the Tomorrow People and lots of Doctor Who's as well, including this one. And because Helen had a musical background, she was very she was very well suited to this. Now, a, a few months back, we had a, a long chat with Helen about her whole time with Big Finish, but. We, uh, we had to talk a little bit about the pirates uh, during our chat, and uh, we're happy to be able to insert that little chat in here right now. Now, one of the, one of the um, big hits of Big Finish, which is, I think, remembered better than most plays, is The Pirates. Yes. Um, and it's the 20th anniversary of The Pirates this, uh, this year. I know, amazing. So it's, yeah, does, does it feel like 20 years ago since you did it? I guess it does because so much has happened in between. Yeah, it does feel like a long, long time ago. Yeah, and of course we've lost um, our Evelyn, so Maggie uh, has gone long, long gone, sadly. So how how were you approached in terms of they must do they know that you sang already? Or was this because once again you said you have connection with Barnaby? How how did you come to be in the Pirates? Yes. Well, Barnaby did know that I was a singer, and uh, and so. Uh, because I was well established with with Big Finish by then, it made perfect sense. Having said that, I hadn't sung for a while when I did that recording, and I was quite nervous about it. Um, it's very exposing to be singing in that context, uh, so close to the mic, and your voice is so exposed. Um, 
And that was my first time meeting and working with Tim Sutton, who uh, was the musical director. And he, what a genius and amazing contact he turned out to be. He's such a great inspiration as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was very unusual because we rehearsed. Uh, we had two days rehearsal. That's absolutely unprecedented. You would never have that <laughs> normally. Uh, but we needed it because we were singing in harmony and, you know, we needed to be in time with each other and, and be familiar with it all. So I, I'm curious in terms of, because usually usually it's two days to record a two-disc story. So how yeah. long did you have, you, you say you had two days rehearsal and then the two days of recording? Yes, yeah. That, that is a big commitment, isn't it? So in terms of where you sent, we sent song tracks first and music first to practice before you came in. How, how, yes, how did absolutely. the procedure work? Yeah, you would normally get the backing track. Um, well, you'd get the whole song with somebody doing the vocal on top. Um, and then you would get the backing track so that you can practice singing on, on top of that. Uh, yeah, and that's it. And that's what I'm used to from musical theatre anyway. Often you get the the songs in advance in that way. Uh, and everyone that was involved in that, I think, was did have a musical background. So it wasn't like we were trying to bring up a, a non-singer up to speed. I mean, even Bill Oddie, of course, had done uh, musical stuff before. So, uh, yeah. What was it like working with Bill Oddie? Yeah, really interesting. I mean, I think I was still at the stage then when I could still get a little bit starstruck by people that I'd seen on TV. Of course, now I'm incredibly (laughs) blasé. Now I'm like, yeah, hiya, (laughs) because I'm so, you know, involved in in working with so many amazing people. But back then it was like, and I had watched the goodies. I mean, I used to love watching the goodies. So that was amazing to be meeting him face to face. And he was a very open um, person and talked about, you know, his challenges and, and the things he'd been going through. And that was all very interesting. And you mentioned Maggie Stables before. What was she like to work with? Yes. Oh, she was everything that you would expect her to be funny, acerbic, um, insightful, kind, uh, a very sort of quiet, confident energy. She just was so centered. You know, you felt so calm and relaxed around around her because she knew herself really well and really just seemed to accept herself a lot. And yeah, I mean, she was always a joy to be around. Because I, I always think of the the pirates as more of a, a a comedy style story, but the scenes you got to play with Maggie were the really heavy dramatic scenes yeah. uh, with her. So lots and you had lots of those scenes with her. That must have been yeah. uh, in, incredible. She was. Uh, what did you did you realize that she hadn't been acting for very long? No. No, I had. In fact, that's news to me. Even now, I didn't know that. Did she come to it very late? Then she did. Yeah, fifties. Did she? How interesting! And of course, she's so popular with the listeners. Um, But that's real life, you know. Real life informs who you are as an actor, and I think people who've done nothing but plays and musicals all their lives have missed out on the bits in between that that really help you evolve as an actor like every job I did in between acting I felt it it added so much to me as a writer and a performer because I was with people who were not theatre people and those are the people we're depicting when we're performing those are the people we need to kind of observe and and emulate so uh, yeah I'm not surprised that she was as real as she was no, of course, one one of the big themes it, 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 it's a it's a amazing production because it, it in some way, so many ways it's a comedy, it's a musical, but it's, it's actually dealing with mental health and suicide is what the, mm, which mm. is what the play's about, um, and I think it must be one of the earliest t- examples, probably the earliest example of the big finish is actually tackling such a, a major issue as suicide yeah. and suicide, you know, how to help someone who's struggling with major mental health and grief. Um, how much did you, what sort of opportunity you get to discuss that and think about, think through things like, you know, dealing with grief and those sort of issues, or do you just have to play on the page? Yeah, you have to play on the page just because of the time factor. Um, but I think it's, I think it's fair to say that most creatives will know what it's like to be depressed. 
Um, however successful you are, I think it is the nature of the beast. If you're someone who can feel incredible highs, you're probably someone who can feel directly opposed incredible lows. And I include myself in that. I mean, I've been a depressive all my adult life. Um, and that is just part of the deal, really. And you learn strategies for dealing with it. So playing a character, I've never been suicidal, but I've certainly been in a very desperately dark uh, place in my life numerous times. And so you just can tap into elements of your own experience for parts like that, as well as using imagination. Which is kind of the message, which is if you can get to the daylight, things might mm. things will look a bit better. But they yes, won't be perfect, yeah. but, but they can look a bit better in the daylight. Yeah, and I, I personally am very good at that. That I'm very lucky in that when I get depressed, I still have a rational voice in my head that says this isn't real. This isn't real. This feeling. This is a chemical imbalance, and however low you're feeling, it will get it will get better. This too shall pass. You know. Um, but not everybody has that rational voice, so I, I feel very fortunate. Um, and just in terms of Jack Rayner and her script? You... Mm, well, I get to work with Jack quite a lot these days because we're working on the Sixth Doctor series together. Um, Jack is such an, a, a complex, deep writer. Uh, she's a complex, deep, amazing person. And she invests a lot of her life experience into what she writes and, and the things that are important to her as well. So all the Sixth Doctor stuff that we're doing at the moment is about themes of disability and um, because uh, Jack is a wheelchair user and with long term um, health uh, challenges. And, and, you know, she's bringing those things to the fore and, and informing people through entertainment. And I, I really admire that. Did you get the opportunity to to watch Colin Baker do his incredible piece because that was quite a yes. quite an interesting <laughs> uh, quite an interesting song we had to sing for that one. Yeah. Were you witness to that? Oh, I was witness to it, and it was legendary, uh, and it will always be legendary. And in fact, my kids listen to all the audio dramas nonstop, and for a while, my eldest, from about the age of ten onwards, um, could could do that song he listened to it so much he could sing along <laughs> so thank you colin thanks so much for that <laughs> it was great to hear it i've cut out all the songs for the pirates and have it as a, on a playlist really just, oh my goodness just all the songs it's one of my little uh, go-to's now and then <laughs> oh that's nice it's that's it's, sti it's still it's still the show that actually i listen to i always cry at the end oh so always brings me to tears so mm. but i'm a big wimp sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Only sometimes. Okay, all the time. <laughs> um, all time. <laughs> all time. I am alone, I've reaped and sown, I bear the fruits of sorrow. But soon I sleep, no more to weep, for there'll be no tomorrow. We were one whole, two hearts, one soul, a source of living woe. I still say, Philip, that Helen is one of those unsung, there's another musical reference, unsung heroes of, of uh, Big Finish. Uh, she's just such a talent across the board. And um, I, think, I think she's not appreciated enough. Helen is an amazing... Well, I can't sing her praises enough. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Sing, ha, ha. Oh, um, another, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Helen is an amazing uh, triple threat. I mean, an amazing actress, but singer and dance as well. In fact, if you go to YouTube, yeah, yeah. You, you can actually go to YouTube um, and search Helen Goldwyn and you can, you can get some of her numbers come up and she does some amazing singing dance routines on YouTube. Well, and they're on her site too. She's got a website. So yeah. they're all located there too. Um, so yeah, very, very talented. And I love Helen as an actress as well. So she's, she's got a lot of emotional depth and I think the, the most recent thing I can remember her being in was a, a ninth doctor story, uh, monsters in metropolis. Uh, that was a standout. She may have been in something since then. That was a couple of years ago now, but, but, uh, this was certainly a standout and, uh, yeah, very grateful to Helen to have a chat with us. Indeed. I don't know why I'm frightened I know 
these songs I'm hearing The leading roles I wish I could appear in I'd be swell, I'd be great Like to think that it's still not too late So don't cry for my poor career I have two children, a house, a husband the folding years, but now you will listen. So come on, guys, I want to sing in town and dance all night. On the strand with a band and a full ensemble and a star on the door makes my heart decline. So I at least gotta try. Another story, never mind. Anyway, promise I'll never go away. It's time on to the change that story. Oh, no the rain is setting in the sky. We never say goodbye. Now, speaking of the musical side of things, we were also privileged to be able to chat with. Timothy Sutton, who not only acts a little bit, or oh, he did act quite a bit. Yes, uh, he's, he's got lots of parts, many, lots many, of, many parts. Of, yeah, in, in this story in, and in, in other big finish. <laughs> yeah, other and big finish too. Other big finish he's, he's been in. Um, but yeah, it was great to get his memories of this because um, he's very, very busy as a musician. So um, some sometimes I worry that busy people like this might not remember something that happened so long ago, but... I think uh, once once the memory gets a little bit uncorked, uh, the memories start flooding out. So we'll, we'll share that chat with Tim Sutton with you right now. So Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd love to start by asking you where you started music from. How old were you and what you played? I had an interest in music, I think, from the earliest stage. I, I was fascinated by the LPs that my assistant headmaster would te- would play as we went into assembly in my nursery school. So I suppose I was about three or four at this stage, and I, I he was playing classical music, um, the Planets and the Toy Symphony and the Nutcracker and and so on. And I think I was drawn to the this music uh, in a way that I don't think any of my fellow pupils were, um, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Um, and then when I started learning recorder um and my teacher mrs hicks when i was growing up in nottingham she she had she said you could spell tunes by uh by using musical notes so you could spell cabbage and baggage and and so on um and would we like to go away and um rec- and compose our own tune and i thought oh yeah that, that would be great um so i came back in next week with my own little sort of eight note tune uh at which point she had, I think, forgotten that she'd ever asked anybody to do and nobody else had uh, had written anything. So I was sort of rather put out. But the idea of creating music from scratch had uh, had been born in me, I think. So um, as I grew up, I, I was sort of playing recorder. I was sort of singing, really enjoyed singing in um, primary school. Um, started to learn the piano when I was eight and started to try and write down my own music from when I was uh, about about 10 or so. So I had a, we had a little kind of proto-pop band um, uh, with some of me and some of my mates. Not that we played any instruments. We got together and called ourselves something ridiculous. I can't remember. Um, and um, whenever I got the chance to, to write music for anything, I did. So we had, when I was at secondary school in Nottingham, we, there was a, a carol competition. So my friend Alistair wrote the mu- the words and I wrote the music. He played clarinet, so I and he sang. So I set it for clarinet, piano, and two voices, and we won won, won the competition. Again, I think there were only two entries. Um and then when it came to writing a musical for the church youth group that I was a part of, um, because I was singing in a church choir and the, the youth group had just started up, we 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 I, I decided that I would appoint myself sole composer 
um, and co-lyricist and uh, wrote a version of Beauty and the Beast. This is in 1986. Um, and then that went on to win a national competition a few years later. So um, I was just I was just writing whenever I could. And I love I loved singing. I loved singing in choir. I loved um, playing piano, just noodling around in piano. Um, and I think my my parents both it, loved listening to music. Neither of them are professional musicians. Um, but also, I think the big part of it was um, my grandma, um, who passed away at the end of last year, at the end of age of one hundred and eight. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, she was a, a leading light in the Bristol Life Opera Club. My my dad's from Bristol and. Uh, there was a big amateur dramatic scene there, so I think, and she had a piano which I would always bash when I I came over to Bristol to visit them. So I think the idea of musicals, musical theatre, operetta was in the family as well. So I was drawn to that, and you know, writing my own made sense. So it's kind of what I continued to do. And writing your Beauty and the Beast, I believe you got to meet Andrew Lord Webber and Tim Rice and a few other big names there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. I did. Um, it, I was very lucky. Uh, the year that I entered the competition, I was living in Preston in the northwest of England. Um, I'd moved schools. I was sort of feeling a little bit isolated from my friends. And um, a leaflet for this competition called the Vivian Ellis Prize, uh, I, I discovered in the lending library in Preston, um, Preston Library, uh, thought well I've got this musical it's for composers under 30 at this point I was 15 16 I think um, I thought well it can't hurt to send it in I did and ended up winning the prize that year and on the panel were Lloyd Webber, Tim Rice, Cameron McIntosh, um, people like uh, Mark Stein um, big critic who was very interested in musical theatre, Dan Crawford, who used to run The King's Head, Wendy Toy, choreographer. So all these all these luminaries suddenly who I got the chance to meet and I got, although Cameron McIntosh wasn't there on the day, he had, we, we were given to understand by the chairman, Don Black, um, another not insignificant lyricist that uh, we, we had had his approval. So afterwards I... I wrote to Cameron and, and to thank him, and he invited me down to his offices in uh, Bedford Square in London, um, and then proceeded to you know spend two hours with me talking about musicals, new musicals, showing me um, videos of uh, the making of Miss Saigon, gave me videos and CDs about you know history of, of musical theatre. Took me out that evening to see Miss Saigon with Jonathan Price. So it was a very heady time for me. Um, and at this point, I was only sixteen, and, and, and felt like I had the weight of my, the weight of the world, um, in terms of the responsibility of writing new musicals. And it's actually sort of taken me, you know, well, from this time till now, to, to feel like actually, yes, I do have musicals w which um, are likely to, you know, to, to go on to, to the stage because it's 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 the hardest thing to, uh, to write. But yeah, that was an exciting time. Mm. Um, you talk about your grandmother being into operetta. So, did your interest in Gilbert and Sullivan come through her? I don't. Rem I, they must have done Gilbert and Sullivan, but I I remember getting excited about it because we went to see a production of HMS Pinafore at the Nottingham Playhouse when I was uh, quite young, when I was about ten or eleven, and then I think there was a production of Pirates of Penzance uh, on the telly. Um, around the same time and, you know and I was I was always attracted to comic music um you know my dad had LPs of the goons and of Flanders and Swan so whenever I heard a song like I am a the very model of a modern major general or Sir Joseph Porter's song from um HMS Pinafore you know I am the monarch of the sea um these great patter songs which had such dexterous craft to them I was really I became really fixated and then when I got out the LP from the library I realized there were also these beautiful melodies um I think particularly those uh, those early operettas of Gilbert and Sullivan Patience um HMS Pinafore 
Pirates of Penzance when they were really blazing a, a new trail, inventing this new style of of, of opera, which married satire with um, with with great show tunes uh, in a way that hadn't really been done before, unless you go back to the Beggar's Opera, you know, in the 18th century. Um, so, yeah, there was something in there that really took hold for me. Um, and whenever I got a chance to work on a Gilbert and Sullivan score, I, I, I would take it um, in whatever in what, whatever form that was. So how was it you came to be writing for the Pirates for Big Finish? I was at school with Nick Pegg. Um, I was at high school with him. And uh, we had recently done a production of the Wind in the Willows at Birmingham Repert Repertory Theatre, which is an actor-musician production, which uh, the, the the idea of which started um, at the National Theatre maybe 10 years previously. So this is going back to 2001 um, when we, we did our production. Uh, I, I knew Nick um, not so well at, um, before then. He was, I think, five, six years ahead of me at school but I knew of him because we were both theatre nerds. And I think after Wind in the Willows, when uh, Doctor Who and the Pirates came up, he just, yeah, he just gave me a phone call and he said, I've had this rather eccentric project to to run by you. Are you interested? Um, and of course, I... <laughs> I was um, hugely interested and excited by the idea because I was also a Doctor Who fan from uh, from an early age as well. Um, so when I kind of got my head around what was required and also when I saw the script and how brilliant Jacqueline Rayner's lyrics for those songs were, um, it was a, it was a no-brainer. I mean, it's very hard to, you know, adequately take on the brilliance of W.S. Gilbert, you know, if you're obviously lots of people do new versions of say the list song from the Mikado, the famous Jonathan Miller production uh, where they update the, the list song every time to incorporate new politics. Uh, pop, yeah, exactly. Current events and so on. Um, but it's not easy to do. And, and um, it's or rather, it's very easy to do in a mediocre way. So, yep. <laughs> but Jack's, Jack's lyrics were, were brilliant. And I thought, well, no, this is just fantastic. Um, and, uh, I had, uh, I had grown up with the, the sort of tail end of Tom Baker. Um, and then the regeneration to Peter Davidson was really exciting. I mean, the idea of a re regeneration was, you know, in those days just brought millions of people to the TV. I mean, it was a very popular program anyway. And Peter Davidson had this, this youthful energy, um, slightly kind of preppy, um, Brides had revisited *Chariots of Fire*, sort of public school feeling about about his doctor, which I really enjoyed. Um, um, there was a terrible time when my piano lessons were were sort of clashing with the time that Doctor Who was broadcast, and and I had a, I think we managed to move the the piano lessons, but the idea of missing Doctor Who was 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 quite painful. Um, and then you know I did I did see. Uh, the the regeneration to Colin Baker, but uh, I was a little bit older by that time, and uh, my interests were, were going elsewhere. But yeah, the the idea that um, Colin Baker and then Bill Oddy, of course, were were involved, it's just like oh my goodness, <laughs> I've got to do this. So when you arrived on the project, you were given a copy of the script. You were given the lyrics to the revised lyrics to the Gilbert and Sullivan songs. I, I assume Gilbert and Sullivan songs were chosen because they were out of copyright. Yes. Um, well, I think there are a number of reasons. Just so, you know, obviously I'm kind of thinking back and and also trying to get into Jacqueline Rayner's head. Um, obviously the whole the whole of Doctor Who and the Pirates is this sort of Arabian Nights thing. We've got to keep telling people stories uh, and keep them awake and keep them focused. Uh, otherwise the consequences will be very disastrous. Um I think there was a Gilbert and Sullivan episode of Doctor Who, but I'm, I may be wrong there. Um, 
but I know that um, the idea of peril on the high seas, the idea of, I suppose that sort of vic Victorian aspect to Doctor Who m matches very well. You know that that those um, those those Dick Dickensian stories that, of Tom Baker. That it, it it feels like a match. I'm sort of trying to think. Um, well, it feels a bit tell us a Wing Chang ish. Yeah, of. exactly. Mm -hmm. That's right. That, and that's the, sort of the music halls and those sort of things were linked. Re ex yes, absolutely. Um, we knew that Colin Baker was a, you know, was a fan of of, of GNS as well. Um, and the idea of, I can't, yeah, I can't think of a more perfect way of the Doctor breaking into song than by singing, um, singing patter songs and witty, witty lyrics, and of course the whole, the whole. Um, the whole maritime nature of the story lends itself so well to so many of those uh, those operettas, and particularly Pirates and HMS Pinafore, both either set on the sea itself or or next to it. Um, so you had two roles to play. One role was to get the recordings done for all the vocals for episode three, the musical episode, and then the score. Let's, let's start with just the episode three songs. So what was involved in terms of getting them ready, getting the cast ready to sing them? And I know you were performing as well. So what was the yes. process what was the process of having that happen? I I believe that what I did was to record piano guide tracks. Again, it's sort of it's it's 20 years and I the the, the, de the details aren't sort of laser sharp in my mind. I but I think that what I would have done is to uh you know, in order to keep the tempo constant which is quite a sort of important thing obviously for um for being able to re do retakes uh, and also to add um, orchestration so i i have a feeling that I, what what i did is i generated piano guides which i brought into the studio and then i would have conducted um the singers over the top of the piano guides then taken them back into the studio to decide on orchestration um, of course, there's a, a element before all that of actually rehearsing the music. Um, and I know that, you know, what, what are, you know, my, my aspiration for, for what the music would sound like was, you know, tempered by experience, you know, and sort of seeing what, you know, obviously we had hugely able performers like Helen, Helen Goldwyn. Um, and then we had performers like Bill Oddie who were, who were very anarchic in the way that they approached it in in the most wonderful way, um, and so I was having to adapt and choose and reorchestrate sometimes, choose different keys, um, make those adjustments in the studio. It's funny because I've just been in the um, in the record in the recording studio last week, uh, recording my songs for a new version of Brecht's Mother Courage. Um, with a live band and with with singers, some of whom are very able and some of whom are sort of more actors who sing. And again, and again, because of the limited time of the recording studio, you are making these quite snap judgments and say, okay, well, we can't quite achieve that in the way that we wanted to. So how do we do this? How do we uh, how do we make that change? Um, but that was all very thrilling. I think we had three days to get the music down, which was, I think this is probably quite a generous um allocation but i think it, it was clear how significant an element the music would be in this uh, in this audio production um so once we had the vocals recorded yeah as i say i, I was able to bring them back into my studio at home and and remove the piano guide if necessary and start to uh, to create you know virtual orchestration obviously we didn't have the luxury of a, a symphony orchestra sadly um but we i did have my box of tricks um and i added whenever i could um acoustic instruments to the mix um i have to say that i think i was quite it was quite new for me to be producing audio i mean now i do it all the time um but i only had a sort of you know it was in the very early days of being able to do orchestration from home from a from a sample library it was so limited compared to what's possible now um 
I know that if I, I that I, I would love to go, <laughs> I'd love to go back and reorchestrate and bring better samples to those. I mean, it has a certain sound to it, but I, I, I wish I just know much more about audio recording and, uh, and and treatment and how to make things sound really wonderful. So that was very much a product of my of my Tyro sort of apprenticeship days, I think. When a sailor is a sailing on the ocean, on the ocean, not getting in the way of pirate plans, pirate plans, we wouldn't even entertain the notion, entertain the notion of slaughtering the sailor and his clans, and his clans. But when he stands between us and some treasure, and some treasure, then homicidal duties to be done, to be done. We would like to leave the sailor at his leisure, at his leisure, but a killer. This lot is not a happy one. Oh, when homicidal duties to be done, to be done, an assassin's lot is not a happy one. Happy one. Was there any collaboration between you and David Darlington as the sound designer, or were they two completely separate entities? Did you have to sort of combine your talents there? Yeah, I was. I mean, I was talking to to David all the time. Um, you know, obviously the way the way in which um, the 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 Atmos the FX sort of interacted. Um, I can't remember who who went first, um, but I th- but I, I know that n- I think it it was very much that I was doing the music and he was doing the the effects. So in a sense, we could work independently to a to a, a certain degree. But yes, that was the first time I, I met David, and uh, you know, wonderful to hear, you know, his his amazing work on on that. Um, and of course, he, he he's a composer as well, so it was nice to, as my first experience of Big Finish, it was nice to understand the history of music on the Big Finish productions through him and through Barnaby, through through Nick. Um, it was a it was a very new world to me um and obviously it was quite you know getting a because it wasn't obviously that the music wasn't just in the the third episode the whole you know the, the songs were in the third episode but the all four episodes had had sound score um well, it opens you know, with very, a very powerful it actually opens musically with the mouth organ and you know, the other yes. key, the haunting so it, the tone is set immediately with music before anything else happens that's right. Yes, um, you know, I was I was pleased that I was able to at least record um, live harmonica on that, um, and I thought that would that would give a an atmosphere, a sort of feeling of fog and fog horns and and sirens, um, the uh, <laughs> the fishy watery type rather than the um, uh, loud loud hailer type, but um, uh, and also. I think I was listening to Britain's Benjamin Britten's Billy Budd, which has this very, very evocative, stark, minimalist opening, just with these two string lines, which are harmonically slightly at ease, especially unsettling uh, feeling. These 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 minor thirds um, set apart from each other, and I know that that was a big influence on uh, on me of how, how I wanted to bring again another another watery tale. Um, um, Billy Budd from the uh, from the Herman Melville story. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think I had these influences outside from from the from the classical world beyond the world of GNS, which were quite helpful to me in putting those things together. So what, what were the instruments you were actually able to use? So you, you're using real harmonica. What, what were the other? Yes. What were the other real instruments? And what, what did you say? The, the, what sort of synth were you using at that stage? Well, I was the synth was a Roland 1080 um, synth module, which I think I bought secondhand from a man in North London. I sort of, you know, I'd, I'd seen some one of my friends using it, or I'd seen it in a studio. I thought, oh, that's really cool. It was before before I could really get hold of a, a robust sam- uh, library of samples. Now, of course, I've, I've got gigabytes and gigabytes of um, of really terrifically good sounding samples um it's so so easy to to find it they're still quite hard to wrangle i think um into a convincing shape um because nothing beats a live no. player 
Um, I can't. Um, I can't remember if there were any other live instruments. Um, you said, you said harmonicas. Much... So that was harmonica. Yeah, none of the percussion was live. Um. No, I well, if it was, I've forgotten. <laughs> the harmonica, I can remember because it's such a significant feature, as you say. Um, was that you playing that or someone else? That was me playing it, yeah. Um, and I think I recorded that at home rather than in the in the um, in the moat. Um, yeah, I think I I, I, sus I suspect that was only one because what the, the, the instruments I play were, are piano, which I was obviously playing. Um, a, well, I was playing a sample instrument whenever there's piano. Um, I play saxophone, and I don't think I used a saxophone. Um, yeah. You know what? I, I'm going to have to go back and, and, and listen. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to the episode. It's been a few years since I've heard it. Well, I was trying to work out what was real and what wasn't. Because, I mean, there's some piano mm. accordion sounds in there, too, and there's piano and strings. Oh, and, there, yes, yes. And there's trumpets. Um, uh, I don't think there was live trumpet, um, but there were. Yes, there would have de definitely been accordion, and I would have recorded that live because I have. I, in fact, I used an accordion for the um, the wind in the willows um, when I was the musical director of that, and it's the score is written by a friend of mine, Jeremy Sams, who's a phenomenal virtuoso accordion player. So I, I, uh, I think I bought an accordion for for that gig and learned my way around the the left hand, which is very different from. From piano, um, the buttons. Yeah, so so yeah, so there you go. So was it was it was it a button accordion or piano accordion that you had? It was the, a piano accordion, yeah, piano. but the button button left hand. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, good. You're <laughs> you're reminding me. So yeah, mouth organ, uh, uh, accordion, um, and if yeah, it's like a test this, and I'm sort of not doing very well on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the advantage of having listened more recently, <laughs> and uh, particularly listening out, listening out for the music. Yeah, I, I know. I did a interview about it for the um, the audio adventures book, and I was, I, th I thought I must dig that out to see to see what I think about it, um, to, think, <laughs> to see what what I remember from uh, from uh, whenever that was fifteen years ago. But um, I was reading um, I was reading some of the the forums, you know, some of the reviews, and then the comments on the um, on the reviews from you know ten fifteen years back, and um, it's really, it's really lovely reading the the comments. How how much it meant to people. How the how much the production touched people in a way that I think nobody quite knew whether it was just going to be this this weird bomb <laughs> that that would just be sort of you know politely uh, put to one side. I think uh, I think nobody knew that it was was going to end up being some people's favourites. I'm sure it's some people's least favourite as well. I, you know, I know some people just hate the idea of anybody bursting into song, but um the um other parts that you had to play, Tim, um, I think you were playing lots of different smaller parts throughout, different sailors, is that right? Yes. Yes. Um because I because I do I mean, because I'm a, an actor as well and I, I act whenever I can, although most of my work is as a composer and musical director. Um yeah, so I I had this uh strange and wonderful running gag of these little these little bit parts these little sailors who would sort of pop up um and john johnson get killed tom or thompson and that's the one yeah so I, I i was able to uh to, to jump into some you know to run to to, to uh, fulfill a, a number of a number of cameos which is essentially the same the same pirate uh the same sailor sorry um who who got horribly mutilated? In fact, I think I think my daughters ended up being quite ups upset when they heard it. You know, heard my tongue being ripped out. I, I'm I'm not surprised really. I think that was right, wasn't it? I got I got a I got a one time yes te terrible <laughs> terrible tongue extraction by Bill Oddie. Um Yes, it goes very dark, doesn't it? it goes very uh, very bloodthirsty um, in a way that uh, GNS doesn't necessarily prepare you for. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that aspect of it, and I think I probably sang along here and there. But Nick, of course, Nick Pegg has a who played Captain Swan had a fantastic voice as well. Um, Helen, uh, Colin, Bill—you know—everyone was able to to contribute musically. 
but yeah, I, I had I had a, a bunch of fun, and I've I've occasionally come in and done the the odd voice here and there on subsequent uh, big finish audios. I think the last one was Time in Office, um, where I came up came in and and was a, a panicky um, IT manager or something like that. Um, but for Helen, in much recently, because I, I I did a sort of little spate of big finish, and then then I I wasn't involved for a while, and then came back in for one. So it's it's a it's a lovely thing to be in the family of um I never really thought that that you know that I would be be a part of any sort of big uh, Doctor Who universe um but it's proven to be uh, a very yeah something I'm very proud of so you've got an out of I mean sorry before we do that one of the things about the score that I think is very impressive is it changes from outright comedy and comic writing in the score to tragedy, and it's sw- it can swing very mm. fast backwards and forwards. Um, how much time do you actually have to write and prepare the score and have it laid down? Um, I think it was a I think it was a few weeks. I mean, obviously there was editing of the audio that had to of the dialogue that had to happen beforehand, um, and you know we had to find a way of knitting the songs and particularly the little short songs which kind of pop up and uh and, and go away again and uh finding ways you know i think it was a real training ground for me it was the first time i'd worked on audio in that way and it's sort of such a an intuitive process where you're going well oh, i think it, you know i think this music should start a little bit earlier um but barnaby the director is su- such a musical chap uh himself that he was able to be very specific about how he felt the music should work out and those comic stings um underlining you know terrible punchlines to jokes and so on um we quickly worked out a, a language between us that sort of held um for the whole time but uh but i i just loved the uh, particular i think particularly the atmospheric stuff particularly the moody stuff and the things that lean into tragedy and the things that lean into mystery and atmosphere um and writing emotional music i think is uh you know that music has that ability to to move people to make people feel nostalgic to cry to to be to be scared uh, and doctor who and the pirates had all those elements um, so it was a great place for me to start. Um, and I think, you know, obviously growing up listening to listening to Doctor Who, listening to, because I also was trying to ch- channel the, um, yeah, that, 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 the mystery spirit, the thriller element um, as, 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 as much as I could. Um, it was a, it was a great challenge, you know, it was a great uh, assignment. And of course, you also had the opportunity to arrange your own version of the Doctor Who theme, what we call it, the Red yes. Jasper mix. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, it's it's one of two arrangements I did of the Doctor. No, three arrangements I did of the Doctor theme because I did a a pitch um, for a, a a TV thing which was on one of the sort of the sort of spin off channels, uh, uh, Doctor Who: The Next Generation. I, I pitched. I was asked to pitch for it and I did a arrangement which was close to the original sort of um, spirit of Delia Derbyshire, but I didn't get the gig. Um, and then I did a, a glam rock version later on. But this one, I think, was um, the, 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 the GNS Doctor Who mashup um, was such fun. And I, I think I, I tried to weave as many Gilbert and Sullivan tunes in as I possibly could in counterpoint with the original um the original tune um so yeah that was my little uh, intellectual um <laughs> nerdy nerdy t- challenge to myself was to try and get as many tunes and I think uh going on the the forums at the time because I sort of started to you know sort of see that I think on the big finish forum and people were starting to talk about it and, and respond to the music. And I think I set people a, a challenge of seeing if they could identify all the tunes. I think, so. I think they did, but I think people did very quickly. I think that the GNS Doctor Who crossover is probably quite strong. 
in terms of the fandom. They call me Evil Evelyn, I am a pirate genuine. I've sailed the ocean all my days, practicing my pirate ways. I fear no man on land or sea. You never get the best of me. I raise my cutlass to my foe. Your pirate queen, I'll overthrow. For I am a pirate king. And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. For I am a pirate king. You are, hurrah for the pirate king. And it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. It is, hurrah for the pirate king. Hurrah for the pirate king. Stop! And finally, Philip, we had the privilege of having a, a long chat with... Nicholas Pegg, uh, talking about his involvement, particularly with this story, uh, but with uh, with the other things to do with Big Finish as well. He was quite involved in those early years, mm. and um, he has a major part in in this one. And it was great to get his memories of of uh, of what went on in this production too. So, shall we just go over to Nicholas Pegg? Yeah, right let's now? go. Let's go, to Nick. That sounds good. Okay, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be talking to you, Philip and Dwayne. Lovely. Now, we want to talk to you mostly about the Pirates because we're celebrating the 20th anniversary. But before we get yeah. to that, this wasn't the first story for Big Finish. In fact, you were in the very first Big Finish. Um, how was it that you first came to work for Big Finish? Well, uh, like so many things in life, it's basically all Gary Russell's fault. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, I was I'm an old friend of Gary's from you know, many, many years ago. We, we've known each other since the mid 80s, I guess. Uh, so in the very early days of, well, before the very early days of Big Finish, you know, when, when Gary and Nick Briggs and, and that gang were doing their audio visuals fan stuff, you know, the, the audio plays, which was the kind of, as you know, the precursor to Big Finish. Uh, I got involved in a couple of those right near the end of the range. I was in two, I think, one, I was just like a background voice doing some chanting or something in one that I think was called Geopath. And then I played quite a big part in what I, again, you'll have to correct me on this, but a, a play called Justice, which I think was just about the last one of the audiovisuals range, or very near the end anyway. Uh, so, you know, I'd kind of just uh, got my foot on that sort of conveyor belt with Gary and the rest of the gang. And so uh, we got on very well and that all went. When, uh, you know, Big Finish kind of started rising from 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 that beginning uh so yeah gary asked me quite early on to do a one of the benice summerfield big finishes uh which was called beyond the sun uh and that was fun with barnaby of course my partner was also in that and um annika wills and sophie aldred and lisa bauman of course so that was all good fun we recorded that at big finish as usual at the time their usual studio uh, was in um Fulham uh, in, in, in London, and they sort of obviously have moved around to various different places since then. So anyway, that was the beginning of it. And then not long after that, uh, a, f a year or, or, or so after that, or just a few months, I, f I forget now, the exciting news came through. I remember Gary phoning me up and saying, well, we've got the license to do actual, yeah, actual Doctor Who now from the BBC. And it all kind of kicked off quite quickly. Um, so yeah, uh, early 1999, I was there at the recording of the very first one, The Sirens of Time, uh, in which I played a tiny little part, but I was mostly there to actually cover it for a, they did a kind of a giveaway CD where I interviewed people and so on. So uh, that was my main role on that one. But then not long after that, I, uh, I'm delighted to say I uh, was asked to act in a few more and indeed to write one. I wrote an early one, The Spectre of Lanyon Moore, uh, which Gary then asked me very kindly if I'd like to direct, which hadn't even occurred to me at the time that he might ask me to do that. So that was lovely. And after that, obviously, I went on to direct some more and act in some more. And the rest is history. I just did one just recently, actually. So, you know, still going strong. <laughs> uh, one called uh, Broadway Belongs to Me is called. I don't think it's actually out yet. Is it coming out soon? Anyway, one of one of the new uh, Colin Baker ones. Right. Fantastic. Which was fabulous. Mm. Now, you mentioned the story you wrote and you mentioned... Um the science, um, the science of time. Um, you've actually had a long connection with um, Maggie Stables because she was in the science of yeah. time. She was also in the story that you wrote, Evelyn Smythe. She was in, in fact, you, you were in her first audio as well, The Marian Conspiracy. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So got, lovely, got, lovely Maggie. 
was going to say, do you want to talk, tell us about Maggie? Yeah, oh, well, Maggie was just wonderful. And I did actually, I, I had already, I had a longer association with her even than that, actually, because the first time I met Maggie was uh, on a theatre season that I did uh, in Sidmouth, in Devon, uh, in the summer of 1996. So that was, you know, we would, we did some theatre shows together. Uh, Nick Briggs was also in the same season, by the way. So uh, the three of us were kind of bonded over various Alan Akebourne plays and a slightly ropey adaptation of Wuthering Heights, I remember. Uh, and it was weekly rep, you know, the old-fashioned uh, thing that hardly exists anymore, but there are a few little theatres around Britain that still do it, where, you know, it's called weekly rep because you do a different play every single week, which is just extraordinary because it means you have almost no rehearsal time. It's as much as you can do to learn the lines and get on and do it. And then the following week, I mean, at any given time, you're kind of working on three plays. You're doing the one that you're performing this week. You're rehearsing the next one for next week. And you're already learning the lines for the one after that, which is just incredible. But anyway, we had a good time. And that was my first time with Maggie, who was just a wonderful... I mean, she was a lovely, lovely person, but she was also a fantastically good actor. Uh, she was a fascinating character. She had so many strings to her bow. She was a magistrate as well as an actor. She was a, a justice of the peace, and uh, uh, she had some extraordinary life experiences, which I think you can actually sort of feel them, even if you don't know about them, in her performances, because she was someone who... I'd lived such a rich life and done so many interesting things that, uh, uh, you know, she she brought this sort of extraordinary... Uh, a kind of substance to her performances, Evelyn, that, that, that spoke of, you know, experience and, and wisdom. Uh, and she was delightful. She also, she had a filthy sense of humour and the dirtiest laugh you've ever heard. So she wasn't sort of grand. She was wonderful. Oh, we used to sit there cackling at outrageous jokes and things. She was wonderful. And um, we, you know, we all miss her terribly, but I, I, I just listened to the pirates again, by the way, before, before talking to you about this. And, and so I, you know, heard her again and it's the first time I've listened to it for a long time. And, um, Gosh, she's good, isn't she? She's just wonderful. Good old Maggie. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, what was it that actually led you to you to become an actor in the first place? Ah, uh, gosh, I don't know. I think it was probably the, um, you know, it's a story that a lot of actors tell, isn't it? That so they at some stage at school, once you'd worked out that you probably weren't terribly good at football, or I, I certainly wasn't, uh, or, or what various other things that you could be good at. I suddenly discovered one day that I was quite good at standing up in front of the rest of the class and showing off and making them laugh and being... And, you know, I was in a school play, the first kind of proper school play of any sort that I was in. I would have been about eight years old and we did a very truncated, probably only 20 minute long or something, edited highlights of The Wind in the Willows. And I was just playing the magistrate who sends Mr Toad to prison um, at the age of eight. And I can just, I can remember to this day, sort of banging my gavel and going, silence in court, and the audience all shut up. And I thought, oh, that's good. I've, I've, <laughs> I've made everyone shut up and listen to me. And so, you know, actors are deeply insecure people. <laughs> and uh, from that point on, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's the way I can, uh, I can make myself heard. But no, I mean, I, I did then obviously discover that I had a, a, a genuine love for, you know, performing and, and for, for the process of, you know, rehearsing and learning a part and, and, because I'm, I did my degree in English literature, and I'm very interested in, in in literature and in drama. So you know, when you're doing something, I don't know, like a Shakespeare play, obviously would be one example. There's, it's not just about the acting; it's about the sort of there's a there's a kind of a intellectual pursuit that I find very enjoyable about it as well. But just as much so with anything, with a Doctor Who script or a or a or a commercial for biscuits, you know, you can, you find a way to play your character in whatever way, uh, you know, is it makes it sort of in some way interesting and entertaining and hopefully, you know, convincing on some level. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. I just, I, I loved it from an early age and uh, got more and more involved in it with school plays, with student plays at university, went off to the Edinburgh Festival as a student and did all sorts of crazy stuff and, uh, and then went to drama school after that uh, and uh, gave it a go. And it seemed to more or less work out. Yeah. Now, no doubt with Barnaby casting this, he needed actors who could also sing. So what's what? Yeah, yeah. So what's your what's your vocal background and history? Uh, well, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, when casting the pirates, you're absolutely right. Barnaby had to choose actors who could sing because everybody needed to pitch in. Now, I wasn't one of the big kind of soloists, as it were. You know, Helen Goldwyn is a is a proper singer. She's a real singer, as you can hear on the pirates, and and so is Mark Siney, who plays Mister Merriweather. Uh, I, I can sing. 
you know, okay, I can sing it in an emergency. No, I, I have, I have actually done a few musicals and things on stage, but, uh, you know, it's not really my, you know, I, I'm never going to play the lead in, 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 you know, the King and I or something. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, and I've, I've sung in choirs and, um, I've, I've sung on a few sort of rock songs and things as well, actually. I've done uh, the odd bit of backing vocals on the side. Uh, so yeah, it was um, it was quite that was one of the challenges that Barney obviously faced for the pirates was finding people who were the right actors for the parts, but who could also uh, join in with with the whole singing part of it. Um, I was astonished listening to it again because I really haven't listened to the pirates for a long, long time. You know, when you do these things at the time that you're working on them, you get absolutely steeped in it, and then of course because Barnaby is my partner, I was kind of there during the whole post-production process when he was putting it together with uh, David Arlington, who did the sound design, and Tim Sutton, who did the music, of course. Uh, so I kind of, by the time it was finished and we kind of listened to the final edit, that was great. And then by that stage, when you've actually worked on these things, you kind of, you know, in the nicest way, you've sort of had enough of it. And I honestly don't think I've listened to it again f- since then. So so this when I listened to it yesterday, it was the first time I'd heard it for well, for 20 years. And I was astonished at quite how much, I'd forgotten how much singing there was in it. I'm amazed that we managed to get it done in the in the limited time that we had. Barnaby ran a, so to speak, ran a very tight ship. Tim Sutton was a superb musical director. I was at school with Tim Sutton, by the way. Uh, we, we'd also known each other for a very long time. And at the time that we did The Pirates, I had quite recently done a stage show uh, with Tim Sutton, Oddly enough, the wind in the willows again, which I mentioned just earlier, I hadn't made that connection. It was this time a full scale production of Alan Bennett's adaptation of the wind in the willows that we did at Birmingham Rep. And Tim was the musical director on that. And I was, um, among other things, I was an oboe playing rabbit. Um, and we all sang in that. So when the pirates came up, um, Barney was thinking, who can, who can handle this? Who can take on the music for me? Tim Sutton was someone who, you know, I, Barney had been to see the show and I said oh Tim's good what about him and he said yes brilliant perfect Tim also happens to be quite a Doctor Who fan so uh, he's he was the perfect fit brilliant musician absolutely genuinely superb uh, musician who's worked with all sorts of you know he's worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company and all sorts of people um and uh, yeah he was just a perfect fit for it uh so yeah yeah i mean it was it was it was joyous to be surrounded by these incredibly talented people as i say i'm a i'm a i'm a kind of okay singer i'm 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 all right at it and i think you know i was quite pleased actually listening to it again I, you know hearing my little bits thinking oh yeah you know didn't didn't completely disgrace yourself there that was all right not bad but yeah people like um mark Siney and helen goldwyn dan barrett also who played jem is a fantastic singer uh, so yeah, uh, we, we were really lucky with the people that we had. It's a very musical uh, day there too. I can hear the birds singing in the background too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a very it's very beautiful spring day in uh, in the UK here, and indeed there are blackbirds and uh, robins and all sorts twittering around me. It's very. <laughs> very it's interesting very you mentioned yeah. you mentioned Gary Russell before, and everything's his fault. <laughs> the, the Pirates is an interesting production because it's something that when we were speaking with Gary about it, he sort of almost didn't want anything to do with it because he, musicals was not his thing. So how did it yeah. all not, not come almost, up? he totally did a total pass. Yeah. He didn't want it at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so where did it come from? Where did the idea for the musical come from? Well, I, that's a question you'd probably have to ask Jack Rayner because it was her script and, and very brilliant it was too. As far as I can remember... Uh, talking to Jack about it at the time, she said that the music didn't actually come straight away. The original idea was to do almost, you know, incredible to think of it now, but almost a sort of straight historical, albeit with the uh, this idea of the Doctor and Evelyn as the sort of unreliable narrators telling the story to the character of Sally and the sort of changing the details as it went along. Uh, and then at some stage in it, and I think it was partly to do, actually, I mean, as I say, you'll have to ask uh, Jack, but I think it was partly to do with how do you um, move so quickly from comedy to really quite hard material. Some really this because there's some very tragic elements in the, in the script. It is a brilliant script as well. I mean, I, I was again listening to it yesterday. I thought, God, this is good. Jack Rayner is such a good writer. Um, so anyway, so how 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 you how you can be funny and amusing and how you can also suddenly switch into into genuine pathos without it being sort of ridiculous and one of the ways in which you can do that is shall we say via the medium of musical theater you know if you think of something like i don't know oliver or or, or les miserables or whatever you know 
a musical gives you the ability to switch from a, a funny sort of song and dance number to something really sad. You know, you can move from Oliver singing Where Is Love to Consider Yourself at Home, and, and it doesn't feel stupid. It's part of the idiom. So I think that might have been the genesis for Jack of, of she suddenly thought, we could do a musical episode. And Sally can be sad, and Colin can be funny, and the plot can be advanced by it. You know, that marvellous sort of HMS Pinafore mashup where the Doctor challenges Merriweather to a, you know, various uh, sort of... It's like it's almost like anything you can do, I can do better, isn't it? That's the kind of gist of it. And, of course, gets him drunk and gets him to fall into the sea at the end of it. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. So I, I think it's a stroke of genius. Gary Russell was always very good when he was running Big Finish um, at uh, matching the right director to the right job you know when when for example and you know when we did charder the the big finished version of charder he knew that that was a good one for me because i'm a huge fan of that particular period of you know the douglas adams period of doctor who and gary isn't really you know but he was very pleased that they were doing it but he knew that it wouldn't be it, it wasn't the right job for him to direct so he asked me to do it because he knew i'm a i'm a big season 17 um so yeah i think i think again with with the pirates uh, once that script came in, Gary sort of thought, "This is this is one for uh, for someone who uh, who knows how to do this kind of thing and can pull this kind of thing together." And I, th- I think Barnaby was a, was an excellent fit for that too. So yeah, you'd, you'd have to ask Jan exactly where the musical idea came from, but I think that's kind of the you know part of certainly part of what brought it together. Um, a standard big finish production is for four episodes, two days of recording. Do you remember was the extra recording done because of all the music or extra rehearsal? What was unusual about the pirates in terms of the studio time was that uh, I think practically unheard of at the time was we were allocated three days in the studio instead of two um, uh, because the recording of the music was obviously going to be much more time consuming than just doing you know the same amount of time of just scenes with acting you know those songs took a long time so barnaby managed to um uh persuade jason hay gallery of the wisdom of having three days in the studio which of course jason didn't need much persuading because it was obvious that we were going to need extra time and tim sutton would come in with his he had an electronic keyboard that he brought in he had already i think pre-recorded some basic accompaniment for some of the songs or or was he playing it no i think maybe he was playing it live actually in the studio and obviously we were all in headphones and things so that that you could get rid of that so we could hear the music tim could talk us through it take us through it uh and we did you know take after take after take uh to get things right uh and tim was just brilliant at you know this is his job this is what he does and he's superb at it but uh the, the the sheer speed that we had to work was something else uh he had also already sent out the scores to us all. I remember that Tim had also had already worked out the musical. And because, you know, I and Helen and Mark and all the other people, obviously, you know, we, we can, are all people who can read music. So he sent us the scores and we were, so we arrived in the studio prepared. Um, and then Tim obviously uh, took over from there. And as far as I can recall, what we did, it wasn't that there was one day where we did all the songs, because that wouldn't necessarily have been a great idea because your voices can get tired, you know. So my recollection is that what we did was that the three days were split up such that we did some of the songs in the morning each day. So we did, you know, the first sort of two or three hours, we did songs, and then we stopped that for the day and got on with recording the scenes into the afternoon. And then the next day we'd come back and start with songs. And it went along like that. Um, But yeah, yeah, great, great times in the studio. Um, I don't think anything quite like it had ever been witnessed at the Moat Studios before. And Colin, I mean, of course, Colin had one of the biggest hills to climb because that extraordinary Patter song, uh, you know, uh, he, I mean, he aced it, didn't he? He absolutely aced it. You know, we took a few goes and not just Colin, we were all singing the, you know, the little repetition bits which are you know it's all very tongue twisting and uh yeah we we had a few goes but we got there in the end i think um and you know maggie bless her i think she was the the least confident about her singing abilities and uh but but tim was so good taking her through it and uh and she came out you know flying colors as well yeah that's great um i should say any other recollections about working with colin working with colin is always just a just a delight he's such a he's such a lovely guy and he's so good in the studio and 
uh, and you know, as the leading man, Colin is very good not just at you know giving his performance, which is important, but he's very good at sort of leading the troops. You know, he he makes sure everyone's everyone's happy and <laughs> sort of looks after us all, which is which is a which is a really nice thing. Working with Colin on this particular one, um, obviously, I, I I had the pleasure of doing quite a bit with Colin in this because there's t- towards the end of it, particularly Captain Swan, which is my character, gets sort of double joined teamed up with the doctor um and so we had all those scenes where i just <laughs> had to be the worst twit in the universe and the, and the doctor had to put up with him and uh we had oh god we had laughs we had such a good time we we really enjoyed it and i think we bounced off each other quite quite well on that one the the, the sort of clash of those two characters seemed to work really well and the other thing the other thing i remember about with colin was that uh there was a line in the Major General song that Jack wasn't totally happy with, and and she came up to me. Um, don't know why she asked me, but bless her, thank you very much, Jack. She she said, Nick, can you think of a uh, of of a better couplet than this? Um, it was something about Rassilon. I think it's also that Rassilon was already mentioned in the song, and she had it mentioned twice, and she got rid of it. So I do remember uh, that uh, she asked me if I could come up with a, a replacement couplet. So I did contribute a little bit. I, I contributed. Um, I listened to it last night and remember, yeah, that was mine. So I jotted it down. The line, um, I've tackled shady Castellans with devious behaviour and sparred with Time Lord Chancellors like Thalia, Goth and Flavia. <laughs> that was me. That was one of mine. Uh, so I, I did. I do also remember suggesting, not seriously, so why obviously. Would, why would Jack I, ask you about those Time Lords? I wonder why. Uh, <laughs> I wonder. I wonder why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, but she, you know, she just wanted something else to go and she'd sort of, I think she was just a bit out of ideas. But yeah, I do remember also uh, suggesting another alternative instead, which obviously was not really uh, 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 a serious suggestion. Uh, uh, it was something like, I've, I've battled mighty foes in every planet. This is, bearing in mind, this is the Doctor singing it. This is Colin's Doctor singing it. I, it was, I've battled every... I've, I've battled mighty foes in every planetary vicinity, and and handsome Captain Maxil shot me in Ark of Infinity, uh, which obviously would be Colin singing about himself. And Colin was delighted about that idea, but Barney quite rightly said, "No, that's too far. That's, <laughs> that's too, too better. Silly. <laughs> yeah, too better. Exactly, uh, exactly. But no, it's uh, lovely, lovely, lovely fun working with Colin. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean the, the the stuff where the Doctor is getting really exasperated with." Um, with Swan, uh, yeah, it was great, great fun, great fun. Now, I've got to say, now Captain Swan goes through a bit of an interesting journey throughout this play because of the unreliable narrators. His personality and his who he is changes quite a bit from the beginning to the end in terms of, I, I guess, he, you know, he starts off probably a proper captain, but later on becomes a total fool, bumbling fool. Um, did, you, did you feel that there was a... I just want to, in terms of recording, you record sort of in chronological order with unreliable, with unreliable narrators, or were you just jumping in and out of it? Captain Swan was uh, was was a really interesting character to play. I mean, first of all, it was a, it was a you know a wonderful part, a gift for any actor. You could tell that just by reading the script. Jack had written such a great character that you you know as soon as I read it, I thought yes, we you know we can have some fun with with this. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's it's. Be- because of the unreliable narrator structure of the story, Swan does sort of change, as I think several of the characters do, change from, you know, at times he's a figure of fun, at other times he is, um, you know, just a sort of ship's captain who gets on with the job of being a ship's captain. And uh, and then, of course, he does actually have quite a nasty sort of underbelly as well. You know, he's a comic character, but he's also a very slimy and unpleasant person um so you know there's a lot to get your teeth into there and actually when i was i remember when f- first reading the script I, I i initially thought i might play it in quite a different way because my first sort of reading my first run through i thought he could be a sort of i think i had in my mind a sort of bluff more like the way that perhaps someone like uh, kenneth connor might have played him in a carry-on film or something like that you know a sort of very much a sort of a what the Blizzes, do you think you're doing aboard my ship? Uh, what, what? You know, sort of character. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, uh, there's that could work. There's there's some possible mileage in that. But then I thought it that might be a little bit limiting, and I needed to find some way of you know, hopefully being you know, get it, being funny, but <laughs> but also of as I said, actually conveying this sort of rather, yeah, I mean, really quite an unpleasant man. I mean, he's so. You know, he's this, this sort of entitled, self-obsessed person who absolutely believes that it's his God-given right to 
to sit at the best seat at the table and have the best cut of the meat, not through anything that he's achieved in life or that anything that he's deserved. It's not because he's been nice to people. It's just because he's very privileged and he is Emmanuel Swan and that's what he's, he's entitled to. And so I, I sort of thought it through and then I thought, you know, sometimes when you're working out a performance, particularly on audio, uh, you have a little think around how other actors might do it or how other characters, fictional characters played by actors might sort of filter it through. Not in order to do an impersonation of them, you understand, but just to sort of, if you kind of collide with something else. And I thought about a bit of that, so I shall let you into the, the dark secret of, of Captain Swan now, which, for all I know, might be completely obvious when you listen to it anyway. But as I say, not an impersonation, but a little spark of thought of how I, I might sort of find my way to the character was actually thinking of the character of Margot from The Good Life, played by Penelope Keith. There's, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's a show that, that gets shown a lot in Australia, back from no, the 1970s. Does. But if you remember Penelope Keith, well. you know, she, she had that, that way of going, well, thank you very much, Jerry. You know, that sort of thing like that. And I thought, that's obviously not the same character, but that was kind of part of my way in to Captain... So we ended up with this kind of, oh, Captain Swan, this ridiculous sort of, you know, very, very slightly drawling, sort of very entitled sort of man who just thinks that he's absolutely above everybody else. Uh, And once I sort of got that thing, I, I think it allowed, obviously... With a, with luck and a fair wind and a, and a, and a vague modicum of comic timing that allowed us to get some laughs. But it also, as I said, it did allow this really quite horrible little man to come through. You know, he's at that scene right at his last scene when he's left with the rubies and he starts fantasizing about how he's going to be rewarded when he gets home. Uh, and he says, Oh, a knighthood, your majesty. Well, if you insist, you know, that. uh, that's where you see, you know, what a, what a really unpleasant little man he is, um, and, and how opportunistic he is. Um, and in fact, Jack wrote that scene right at the last minute. Um, I think I might have asked her to. I can't remember. I don't mean in the studio. I mean a little bit before when I first read it. I phoned her up in great excitement and said, this is brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing it. My only slight comment is that Captain Swan hasn't got a last scene. He hasn't got a sort of, last bit he just sort of is swan finished song. with and is left a swan song if you will and jack said bless her heart she she very kindly she said oh you're absolutely right uh I'll, let's see what i can do uh and uh, she indulged me and she wrote that little extra bit in which i think was wonderful and so thank you very much jack i really appreciate that it was <laughs> it was lovely as was the whole the whole part um i did rather naughtily ad lib some extra names when he's tied to the mast of the ship I think in the script it was just, uh, oh, Emmanuel Swan, tied to me own mast. And I, I gave him some extra middle names, which Jack didn't seem to mind too much. So that, I think it was Emmanuel Hubert Clarehue St. John Swan or something like that. They all came, it, just came to burst together. Yeah. Yeah, it's something like that. But, but yeah, it just seemed at the time to be uh, appropriate. Was it Captain <laughs> Swan who had the first meta line in the story? Something like, uh, on, on this ship we execute stowaways? From uh, oh, Earthshock. Yes, that's right, which that is was... an Earthshock line, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Do you know, I'd totally forgotten that until I listened to it yesterday. Uh, yeah, is that the first time you in the script that first you started hearing? First time I picked hearing... up on it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, interesting. I had totally forgotten about that, as I say, until I until I heard it. Yes, yeah, so and when you get to something like that, you've obviously, of course, you've got to, it's, as a Doctor Who fan, obviously I got what that was referring to, but you've got to play it. You can't just slip into you know, doing an impersonation of that scene from Earthshock, but at the same time pay it a little tribute, whilst for those who don't know that it's referring to anything, you've got to keep it keep it real, as they say. As much as one can keep anything real in a <laughs> unreliable narrator, musical, pirate, fantasy, audio play. But, um, yeah. Who be that? Bellowing like a hatton from hell? A stowaway, by gad! Yeah. Yeah. So- I'm not a stowaway. On this ship, we execute stowaways. On this ship, you don't give the orders anymore. It's just a recording, so do you know whether it was done basically chronologically and then you slid, the songs were put in later, or were all the scenes um, with uh, Helen, Sally, Sally's character and the Doctor done together? Do you, know, do you remember how it was recorded? As so often when recording uh, an audio thing like this, you can't 
it's very rare that you can do it completely in, in chronological order because studio time is so limited. You know, you really have to crack on and get on with it. If you did sort of a Sally and Evelyn scene where it goes in the script and then they leave the studio and then all the pirates come in and do the next pirate scene and then they go out and then Sally and Evelyn come back in again, you would waste so much time. And also, of course, you would lose the sort of rhythm of, even though the scenes divide in that way, for the characters who are together, the energy and the pace has to stay the same through those things. So, so no, it wasn't recorded completely in chronological order, but what would happen would be that, um, you know, for example, the Sally and Evelyn and Doctor sort of narrator scenes, they would do a, a whole chunk of those in a, in a, in a row. Um, I, I forget exactly how it was divided up, but they would perhaps do the whole first episode's worth of them in one session, you know, and take, take an hour or an hour and a half or something, whatever it was, to do those. And then we'd sort of go back to the beginning and start doing all the pirate scenes through for that episode, that sort of thing. So, you know, <clears throat> a, a good director always tries to record it as much in chronological order as possible because it just helps everyone. Uh, but you just, you, you can't do it totally chronological because it would be, it, you know, logistically, it would be far more complicated than, than the alternative. Uh, so that's how it was done, really. And the songs certainly were not done in, in, in situ. They were done completely separately. Um, uh, as I said earlier on, you know, in the, in, we did those in the mornings. Um, but, uh, I, I expect we probably did them in order you know, in their own chronological order. You know, we'll do the first song first and the next song next, I think. Although, actually, I can't remember that either. Maybe we didn't. That would have thrown Colin right in at the deep end with his big number. Maybe we did keep that one till a bit later. Mm. We've talked so much about the Pirates as a story, but we're, we're yet to mention Bill Oddy. What are your mm. what are your memories of Bill and, and how was he enticed to, to join this cast? Yeah, I think Barnaby... Um, thought long and hard well, of course he did he always, he always does but I, I i think he had quite a long sort of period of thinking who who are we going to get to play this pirate king because it it was a very specific ask it had to be someone who could obviously be the sort of guest star pirate king um but it had to be someone who who was going to absolutely get that it was heightened and it was and that the story that evelyn was telling was sort of unrealistic so we we were allowed to be slightly kind of big in our performances without being ridiculous. But then there has to be the, you know, there have to be these moments of genuine evil with, uh, with that character. You know, he does some terrible things. He cuts a man's tongue out. He, of course, kills the boy. Um, so yeah, I think Barney went through a lot of thoughts and ideas. And then at some point, I think <laughs> I, I'm, maybe I'm misremembering this, but I do vaguely remember him sort of bursting into the room and going, I've got it. Bill Oddy. Uh, and uh, I thought, yeah, brilliant. That's really off the wall. It's not, you know, you'd sort of, reading the script, you'd kind of expect some big sort of, you know, Brian Blessed type actor or something. But actually, uh, Bill Oddy was a stroke of genius. And Barnaby and I are both, and have been since childhood, since long before we ever knew each other, we're both massive fans of the goodies. Um, that was something that I just used to love in, in watching in my childhood. And, you know, we have both of us directed Graham Garden in some other big finishes. And Barnaby also worked with Tim Brooke Taylor uh, as well. So kind of got the full set. Dear old Tim. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a great idea. And then, and then Bill came in. The interesting thing was that, uh, as, as, as a, an actor often does, um, he delivered a bit of a curveball because he decided he wasn't going to do the sort of, you know, the most obvious sort of pirate accent is the, you know, the sort of West Country, so, ooh, ah, ha, ha, are you, are you a pirate thing. And it, Bill instead gave it this kind of sort of Irish uh, twang, which was, and there's no reason why not, of course. You know, pirates can be from anywhere. In fact, when we were doing the big Finnish Treasure Island a few years later, which Barnaby also directed, there were, we had big talks about this because if you, leave a load of actors to their own devices to play some pirates. They are absolutely all just going to go, ooh, are me hearties, are. Uh, and on audio, it's something like Treasure Island, which had a much bigger cast, you know, lots of different characters. That won't do, because everyone's just going to sound the same. So we did quite a lot of work working out that, and it, it makes for a better crew of pirates anyway. Why wouldn't they come from different places? So we had, you know, you're going to be sort of East End London, you're going to be Cornish, you're going to be, I can't remember what we had, we had some Yorkshire pirates and all sorts. And that makes it much easier for the listener to get, 
which characters speaking and which which one you know rather than as i say if you left a load of actors together they'd all just be going ah for the entire thing <laughs> so part of you was very good at marshalling that so anyway i digress um bill uh was great i mean he gave a really sort of full-blooded performance didn't he he's, he's quite furious and he absolutely hits the 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 i think hits the right note of being um sort of funny and silly and ridiculous and also terrifying and and evil and and disgusting i think i think um uh i think i think he enjoyed it he uh you know we i'm sure he enjoyed it we 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 had a we had a great time in the studio he was um i think he was quite bemused by it because obviously it's for for a sort of outsider to the world of doctor who and big finish it was a particularly odd uh project to, to, to be parachuted into i don't i mean he, he got it he knew what it was and he understood it but i just think he, I, I think he might have slightly thought is this do they, do they do this sort of thing all the time this is a bit peculiar isn't it but uh but he um no he uh, yeah he was he was great fun to work with and um yeah oddly enough I, I didn't actually have that many scenes with him but obviously he was there for for for, for the whole recording sessions so we we sat around in the in the green room together but i was quite often i was in the studio with colin or the other people and then he we only had a Bill and I only had maybe three or four bits together, I think. Uh, but yeah, lovely, lovely to work with. So even though Bill Oddie was probably the biggest name in the cast, it's actually very much an ensemble piece because I think, listening to it, nearly every actor has a similar amount of lines throughout. They sort of get shared around very generously. Um, is there anything else you want to yeah. mention about any other cast members? I mean, Timothy Sutton is always changing characters. <laughs> but, you know, how, how do you get 15 yeah. characters out of one actor? Tim Sutton did an amazing job because obviously, as we've said, you know, his, his principal role there was, was to be the musical director and, and that was a job that no one else could possibly do and he was brilliant at it. But of course, he was also playing, uh, various characters, which he loved. He loves a bit of acting and he's a good actor, is, is Tim. And, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> he has, the, I mean, of course, that's one of the, um, <clears throat> sort of jokes of the script, isn't it? That, that, that all the sort of, uh, chorus sailors on the on the ship are all called john johnson and bill bilson and tom thompson and you know and they're all kind of interchangeable but tim did actually get a different character out of each one in in some way or another it's really very clever and especially doing that while having so much else on his on his plate you know the 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 the, the task that he faced it, it was you know putting together the music was immense and uh the fact that he managed to play those brilliant little characters as well and mark Siney, we haven't really mentioned him much who plays merriweather in it um is such a lovely guy very good actor um barnaby had worked with him before um several times on uh on pantomimes actually which i know is a very um very British form of entertainment, which sometimes <laughs> baffles people from other uh, nations. But uh, but yeah, um, they had both played, uh, you know, the, the the ugly sisters in Cinderella together, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, Mark Sine is a is a brilliant pantomime dame and a very very good singer um, and a very funny man. So he was great. It was lovely working with him. It was a very. It was. I, I remember it being. You know, even though there was a lot of work to do, it was a very fun, relaxed sort of atmosphere in the in the studio. And also, you know, some of it was quite intense. Uh, Helen Goldwyn's character. You know, she has uh, she has some really quite big emotions to uh, work through. But you know, Helen is such a such a superb uh, actor and a superb singer. Uh, and she just uh, she absolutely knocked it out of the park because she's really the sort of the the heart of the thing isn't she that character and evelyn they they they're what gives the whole allows this whole <laughs> crazy whirlwind of pirates and songs to sort of they, they they kind of swirl around this this emotional core which is actually very genuine and uh, and helen brings that to the table superb i think most people who love big finish would put this story at least in their top 5 if not their top 10 i think it's put in my top 1 wow um yeah <laughs> what Having just listened to it again, why? What do you think it is that means that this keeps appealing to people? I think it's a combination of things. Um, I mean, it is first and foremost. It re- it's a really, really strong script from Jack Rayner. She's she manages to she does so much. You know, it's entertaining, and it's funny, and it's exciting, uh, and it's you know it's got all the sort of roister doistering sort of pirate action. And it's got this, you know, quite emotional sort of actual. The 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 underlying story is 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 really quite a serious one, and and it's not, you know, played for laughs. Uh, so that's an interesting sort of combination. But then adding the unreliable narrator thing, the fact that Colin and Maggie sort of break off from telling the story and start arguing with each other about what happened on uh, at any given moment. 
that gives it another little layer of of uh, of of loveliness. And then, of course, it's the music, isn't it? I mean, the the uh, the songs. I was I, I said, you know, again, listening to it yesterday for the first time in many years. I'd actually forgotten quite how many songs there were and that the, that whole third episode is pretty much song after song after song. Uh, and I'd forgotten there was so much of it. And, they, and they, they're, they're really good. Uh, and so there's that, you know, it's a very unusual, it's a very unusual thing. So I suppose it's, it's a strange chemi- chemical reaction that's happened there, is it, to create this. It's, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a one-off. You couldn't do one like that every time or, or, or sort of ever again, really. I mean, it's, there's, there's, it's, a, it's a complete one-off, isn't it? And um, so I guess that makes it really very special. And the thing about as well about the music, which we haven't really mentioned, is that uh, it's not just about the songs. Tim's incidental music that he wrote for the, for the, the rest of it is so beautiful and so clever as well i mean he's doing i i I won't get most of the references that he's doing because he's so well uh versed in music he's a you know he's a real scholar of 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 classical music and i know he has a particular interest in in 20th century british music and so you know and there are throughout the incidental music there are nods to benjamin Britten and elgar and vaughan williams and various other composers and then of course that amazing (laughs) Gilbert and Sullivan esque version of the closing theme that Tim rustled up for the for the for the end of part four. I mean, it's genius. The the man is the man is 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 a, is a, is a marvel. Uh, so that also makes it very special, I think. Um, Tim did a similar thing a, a bit later with Barnaby, didn't he? When they did um, the glam rock one, hor- horror of glam rock, where he and because of my sort of David Bowie connections and the fact that I'm a bit of a student of glam rock, Tim got in touch with me and asked for some pointers and you know what are the um you know the sort the sort of sort of main features of of, of your classic sort of glam rock so i and because he's, this he's a classical composer he didn't know as much about about that whole sort of so i talked him through a whole load of things and you know and sent him some key tracks you know some mark boland tracks and some david bowie tracks and some roxy music tracks and said listen to the piano on that one listen to the hand claps listen to the you know these, these are the things that put together to make them and of course tim also he there was a song in that but again for i think for the final play out he did a kind of glam rock version of the doctor who theme tune which is bliss absolute bliss um, yeah, that's, a, and, that's a good one uh, yeah <laughs> yeah 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 Good old Tim Sutton. He's he's marvellous. Do you think it's got much connection with Buffy the Vampire? I mean, the, Buffy, the musical episode of Buffy came out in 2001, so this is about two years later. Do you think there was much homage to that? Well, now, that's interesting. I, I was aware of this at the time because, because someone told me, <laughs> obviously, but I have to confess, I'm afraid what I know about Buffy the Vampire Slayer could be written on the back of a matchbox. I've never seen a single episode of it, not through disinclination but just it was something i never got round to and one of these days i will so i don't i've never seen the musical episode but i was aware that this was a thing that had been done now whether whether that was any of the impetus behind doing a musical thing an episode of doctor who i i honestly don't know you'd have to ask jack um it may have been part of the uh the sort of inspiration or at least the you know it may, it may have been part of the reason why gary might have felt yes it is possible to do this because Buffy have done it, so it's not that mad. It's someone else has done it, so we can do it too. That may have gone through his head. I've no idea. You'd have to, you'd have to ask him. So yeah, I'm afraid I'm a, I'm a Buffy ignoramus, uh, but I will get round to it one of these days. I sail the ocean blue, attentive to my duty with Captain Red and crew. I cruise in search of booty. When anchor we weigh and we sail away and find a fine ship to pursue. The men look to me as the man they want to be. I'm a better sailor far than you. Hurrah, hurrah, Mr. Merriweather's best. Hurrah, hurrah. Shall I put him to the test? You've changed songs. I meant to do that. I am the doctor from the TARDIS boat. You've never seen a one like me. I'm a sailor through and through. Nothing nautic I can't do, though I've hardly ever been to sea. I wonder if you'd win if a contest we begin. Can you climb a rig like me? Well, it's the 20th anniversary of Doctor Who and the Pirates this year. Uh, the anniversary was a few months ago now. But it's still in the year, so we're calling it the 20th. Uh, do you think Do you think this will ever be topped as your favourite? What would what would they have to be to to top this for you? Um, an, enti- an entire musical episode with all four episodes <laughs> might be able to do it. Um, I, I mean, um, Bonnie Langford just did a a couple of songs in a recent in her releases on the the Broadway with the, with the Sixth Doctor release. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, that was once again very funny, 
also in the musical theatre. Wasn't as much singing as I would have liked. I would have liked a lot more. But yeah, that, that, that's the sort I of think thing. The, I think the episode was called Broadway Belongs to Mel. Wasn't yes, it? it was. Yes, it was because it was a takeoff of the song um, "Tomorrow Belongs to Me," which is all about Nazis in um, Liza Millie musical Cabaret. So right. it, "Tomorrow Belongs to Me" is a, it's, it's, a, it's a bizarre song because it's all about. It sounds so triumphant and wonderful, and then when you see it in its context of, of the musical, it's Nazis all singing about "Tomorrow Belongs to Me." It becomes a dreadful piece of song, a propaganda. So. Right. It's, it's, it's actually, I remember singing as a song as a school kid and learning it okay. because it's, it's a bit like, yeah, it's a small world. Yeah, you know, tomorrow belongs to me. It's a, a rising, wonderful anthem. But mm-hmm. then when you see it in its context of the musical, it totally changes the meaning. Um, and because the whole story is dealing with Nazis and coming war, and so yeah, tomorrow belongs to Mel is a play on that lesson, you know, a play on Cabaret, her singing, her dancing, et cetera, and, and Nazis. But yeah, I mean, once again, very clever. See, Big Finish can do such amazingly talented things when they try. I, I, I guess partly the Pirates now has a place because of nostalgia. So there's there's certain things that just hold a place that you can't, you can't let go of because of nostalgia. It's hard to know, could something be better than the Pirates? Things probably are better than the Pirates. But nostalgically, it was at a time in Big Finish where every single production was just wonderful after wonderful after wonderful. Partly it was because it's all very new still. I was enjoying the experimentation. And so for me, this is you know, the great classic time of Big Finish, um, which is bizarre because I'd, I'd look at other times and other shows now and I get just as, they're just as great. Mm, but but yeah. it, ha- it has a nostalgia for me that this period does. And the Pirates in particular, because it took me on an emotional journey, because I cried, uh, because I just think the casting is, is just, th- there's nothing to fault in this production. It's a 10 out of 10 in every way, and I, I don't score productions. But there's nothing to fault. Every performance is perfect. The, every beat of story is perfect. The dialogue is enhanced, ridiculous at times, but then so naturalistic. What Jack's done with the, with the dialogue because it's the modern times and the story times. The way every character develops and grows and you see change. Because once again, with Evelyn, because she's a big finished character, you could develop a character. You don't have to leave them at the same point like you do with a Doctor Who TV show character. It has so much going for it that I still, every time I listen to it, it just blows me away. And, yeah, I, I love it. Very good. All right. Well, that's our feature on Doctor Who and the Pirates, the 20th anniversary of this fantastic story. And there is absolutely no excuse for you to not hear it. If you haven't heard it, I recommend either buying it. It's very inexpensive to buy. Uh, and you can listen to it anytime on the Big Finish app or you can download it. Or if you don't want to go that far, you can go to Spotify and listen to it there. It is available uh, as uh, many of the early big finishes. So uh, please jump over and listen to it. Uh, it is it is definitely well worth your time investment. All right, Philip. We're just going to recommend the Pirates today. We're not going to come in with our own recommendations. So We are. Thank you for uh, indulging me with my favourite show. Ah, oh, my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. And um, n- next time, uh, you may have noticed that last on last episode of the podcast, we said that we were going to be talking about the Villains trilogy this time, but uh, that that's been put off uh, for a couple of weeks. So we'll get we will get to that very soon. We're just waiting for a little bit of extra material to come in before we release that to you. And you realise that while when this is being released, I'm actually sailing on the big blue seas. Yes, you are. Oh, you are. You are too. How's that? Yeah, I'm on the ocean when this is being released. That's cool. Don't get attacked by pirates, whatever you do. Hopefully not. Uh, so, so next time we are going to be dealing with uh, a tentative Doctor Who connection because it's the Doctor Who 60th anniversary season for the Sirens of Audio. But we have a special guest and that special guest is none other than Brian Croucher who was Travis in Blake 7, the second series of Blake 7, but he also appeared in Doctor Who uh, in 1977 in The Robots of Death. So uh, the, he's been in it, one of a... There was only a few of them in the Blake 7 cast that had been in both Doctor Who and Blake 7. I think it was Paul Darrow, Michael Keating. Jackie Pierce, Michael Keating, and him. I think they were the only, the only four. 
that were in Doctor Who as well. So, and the way we're connecting it to our anniversary series is that it is going to be, uh, well, it is 10 years this year since the first full cast Big Finish Blake 7 audio. So that's our connection to uh, an anniversary theme. We, we'll we find a connection anywhere. We don't, don't care how that. tenuous it is, as long as it fits <laughs> the anniversary theme. You know, you know, I think we could just put out yeah. Brian Crouch and people listen to it anyway, Dwayne. I think that would, but <laughs> I can, if I can find a link, I'll, I'll put it in and I found one. So there you go. All right. Well, that'll be next time. And uh, today has been an absolute blast. Thank you very much, Philip. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Yeah, let us know how you think in the comments. We really appreciate seeing people's comments and um, love to reply to them. So let us know what you're thinking. And it'd be great to see you today. Talk to you later. See ya. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 172, celebrating the 20th anniversary of Doctor Who and the Pirates with your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Special thanks to our guests, Nicholas Pegg, Tim Sutton and Helen Goldwyn with archive material featuring Colin Baker. Thanks to Big Finish for archive material of Bill Oddy and Maggie Stables. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Closing theme music by Tim Sutton. More about us from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.